Welcome back to the Food Bod Pod YouTube channel. In this episode, we're talking to Simon Body, Master Butcher. Hear his tips and tricks and so much more. And join us for making lemon curd with Cherie Denim. But first... In this episode, you find us in uh, a picturesque place called Great Brick Hill in the middle of the Buckinghamshire countryside. And we are visiting the best butchers. We are here today with Simon Body. Thank you for having us. As those of you um, eagerly may realise, we have the same surname because this is my elder brother-in-law. Let's get that right this time. This uh, Simon is married to my no. <laughs> Simon is my husband's brother. Oh. Can you just do that again? Just explain. <laughs> same, same surname because Simon is my brother-in-law. Yes. We have the same surname because Simon is my brother-in-law, because Simon is my husband's older brother. There we go. I need to get that one in, didn't Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, the, uh, we're, it's kind of family business. And um, what I always think is funny is what people probably, but there's no reason anyone would know this, is that my maiden name is Butcher. Did is you? It? Yeah. <laughs> Did you not know that? I didn't know that, no. Yeah, my maiden name is Butcher. Oh, right. Yeah. So I'm a vegetarian in the family, and my maiden name is Butcher. Wow. Yeah. So, um, which brings me on to another point. Um, yes, I am vegetarian, but this is a food podcast, and we want to talk to everybody in the food industry, and different food producers, different food lovers, um, and Simon is a butcher and we are abusing the situation and um, making the most of it basically so I want to call you a master butcher is that right yeah 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 what does the term mean it's a master of the trade I suppose you can perform all the tasks of the trade from okay. killing the animal food to say making a sausage or a ham or Okay. So working as you're running the business, um, that would be yeah. In Europe, they call you have to you have to attain a master butcher's qualification to have business. So it's a certification. In in Europe, yeah, especially Germany, um, I think France is the same, and Holland. Okay. Um, could be wrong, but I know Germany for sure. Um, okay. But yeah, and it's a three, four year course. It's almost this degree level. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, but you don't do that in this country? There's no recognised qualification for it. There, there's an organisation called the Institute of Meat. They used to do three different exams. Um, I don't know if they still run them or not, but that was similar, similar. But okay. yeah, I didn't. I just did it house training for my first job, so I um, had an apprenticeship. So, um, I mean, I've been in this family for like maybe 22 years. Yeah. Um, and you've always been a butcher for all that time. So how long have you been doing this? 14 years. God, man and boy. Yeah. 14, 15, started clearing up in a butcher shop. Well, the butcher's department of a supermarket. in Stony Stratford, old family supermarket called Bishops. They're not around anymore. Um, now Budgeons. Oh, not anymore. Budgeons is gone. Yeah, uh, Budgeons is gone as well. Right, yes. OK. Anyway, so that's where I was working part time after school and stuff. And then kind of fell into a full time job there. Worked there for four or five years, I suppose. Moved around various stalls, then went to work in a butcher shop, shop, traditional butcher shop. Uh, done some work in a factory, catering, buttering, looking after hotels and stuff like that. That was uh, only every few long hours, three in the morning to five in the evening. Wow. Yeah, it was a busy place. Um, and then I worked for a game dealer for a bit. I think that was probably my most favourite job that I had. Then I kind of ended up here. Um, worked here for two years and then bought it. So yeah, it's been mine for just over 30 years. But the story I was always told that you went from budgets to here, so I didn't realise you had No, 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 there, was a, there was a bit in between that. And um, yeah, like I said, the game dealer, um, he's definitely out of blessing. Um, yeah, that was my favourite joke. Well, what made that? Well, because it was totally different. We, we got wild game in and we, we used to. Uh, Skin a butcher, sixty to hundred deer a day. Wow. Um, That's quite a physical 
judge I mean. Oh, that gets in this hard work. Um, and then pheasants, partridges, all the all the usual suspects during the game season. Wild pigeons, wild rabbits, hares, everything. This is a whole different world for me, which is why it makes me the perfect person to ask the questions, really, because it's something that I don't know massively about. So, yes, I live with meat eaters and we prepare meat in our house. I just, I'm not the person that eats it. But it means that I can ask some basic questions, which um, you may well tell me uh, not relevant questions, but I, oh. I will try my best. Um, so, you know, when it comes to me, um, you know, you've got customers coming in a couple of days a week, yeah. um, and the rest of the time we're preparing for that. Yeah. So, what is the question you are asked the most? What do you recommend? Okay, and are they going to tell you what they want to put with it, or are they just asking you what's good that week? A lot of customers, especially the roasts, will say, what about steak, what do you recommend? Okay. So, which is good. Yeah. Um, and, in fact, a lot of the ladies will ask the same question, but I think with, with the chaps, the steaks on you know, the forefront, but steaks and sausages, um, but yeah, what do you, they always ask us what that would recommend. And because you get to know the, your customer, some don't like fat, so you point them towards a leaner piece of meat, okay. or some as well mild, and got some fat on it, and they like the fat, but you push them towards that. So this comes back to talking to somebody that knows their stuff. I mean, we had a similar conversation when we were talking to a cheese maker recently. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it, it takes great pride in making all of their cheeses and, and being so knowledgeable about it. And again, he was talking about when they sell at markets, the beauty of the fact that people are coming along and saying, what do you recommend? Or what's going to go well, with this? Or if they're going to cook with it or something, or what? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it comes back to that, you know, actually, if you do get to know your butcher or your cheesemaker or your baker, then people have that knowledge to be able to give you that recommendation. That's not when you go, if your car's broke, you go see a mechanic, don't you? Yeah, and then, a nice piece of meat, you're going to your local butcher. Yeah, and get the recommendation yeah. and get the best possible service. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the other thing that I always find fascinating then, when we have come down here, is someone comes in and they say to you, uh, I want a job for the weekend, and your question is how many people are going to be eating it? How do you know from that what to give them? Well, there is a basic rule of thumb, you would sort of say, it's, say eight ounces of meat per person, so you the first thing we do is we put a big piece on the scale. So yeah. right, that, that weighs, say, six pounds. Which one? A third of it? Or half of it? They'll always buy more than they actually need. Right. Um, so yeah, we just, we, it depends on the customer. If you know them really, really well, we just cut them a piece, because that's what they have every time. Okay, but Whereas, also you'll know how big the consumption maybe they have. Yeah. Some people eat more than others. You put a piece of meat down, put a knife on it, and they go, oh, that's too much. Move it back a bit. <laughs> so it's, it's by as simple eye, as that. Okay. It's as simple as that. So it's by eye, to yeah. say, so. Okay. Yeah. All right. So some basic questions then. If someone is buying meat from you, drunk meat, or whatever they've bought, they go home. What's the best way for them to store it? Take it out of the packaging, put it on a plate, and the coldest part of your fridge, which is usually the bottom bar, and it won't drip on to, on, onto anything else. Um, but yeah, out of that. Uncovered. Yeah. Okay, so you've just got it in your fridge. It'll dry out a bit, but that's not going to do anything else. Okay, and when you're then coming to cook that, are you cooking it from cold or you leave it to come to room temperature room first? Room temperature. Okay. If you are cooking it from cold, I assume that you're going to need to add some extra time on cooking it anyway. Correct. Okay, so the best way to go by a recipe is going to be to do it from room temperature. Yeah, if you've got a bit of steak in there in your fridge half an hour before you're going to cook it, spring it out and then. My wife will get the joint out in the morning when we get up, just put it on the side. Okay, ready for cooking yeah. later. Okay, yeah. so once it is cooked then, or once something's roasted, I see all of these things on telly and people talking about resting the meat. Yes. Uh, so first question, how do you rest it? Basically, you're gonna, it's going to come out of the oven and you want to keep, keep it in a warm place, not a hot place, a warm place that can relax. Okay. And that way it's going to be easy to carve, right. or cut, piece of steak, whatever. It's going to be more juicy. 
so that's the why. Yeah. Okay, so you are doing it for a reason. Yeah. It's not just to make space in the oven. No. Okay, so it's going to make it. If you've got a joint, if you cook a joint of beef, two joints of beef, mm -hmm. off the same piece of meat. Yeah. Same temperature, same internal temperature, or basically the same, exactly the same. You get one out straight away and cut, cut it and eat it, and take the other one out and rest it. You would say there were two different bits of meat. Oh, that different? Yeah. So North and south, yeah. So if you take it straight out from the oven and cut into it, it's going to be tougher? Yeah. Okay. So you're leaving it to relax. relax, and it's going to do that from the steam? It will do that because it's going to start to cool down a bit, isn't it, as well? But that's, I've always wanted to know, but it won't get, get cold. cold. It won't get cold. Okay. Because the heat's right in the middle of it as well, isn't it? Okay. So that, you just keep it beautiful. So what's the best way to actually rest it then? I, I, I rest in a cool box. Okay. So you're actually just putting it in an extra cool box? Yes. Yeah. Just in insulated space, basically? Yeah. With the lid on, a whole shebang? A jar, slightly. Okay, so you're Just to let some steam out, yeah. So if somebody at home is using foil, yeah, but just loosely cover it, not wrap it. Okay. Because that steam will continue to cook it. Yeah. Okay. You don't want that out of the oven done. I'm learning. Okay. You, moist heat will move cook. It's, it's, it's hotter than dry heat, if you like. So if you put your hand in 80 degree water, yeah. you'll scald yourself. Yeah. Whereas if you put your hand in an 80 degree oven, you go, oh, that's, but it won't burn you. Right, yes. You see what I mean? Yes. So, and how long would you rest something for? Well, a lot of the chefs would say, rest as long as you roast. That long? Okay. So I, I, I'm, I have two ovens at home. Yeah. So, to me, I can see, you know, I have lots of space for cooking and baking. But if someone's got that one single oven, I can never figure out how they can. So the meat's done, yeah, meat's so done like, first out on the side. So that all helps with that as well then. So that, I suppose the longest thing after that should roast potatoes, isn't it really? So everything else would be done while the meat's resting. Yeah. Okay. See, as, as I said, I am learning because I'm, I'm not a, a, a meat cooker. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I know. Yeah. <laughs> or a meat other, as the case may be. Okay. Um, so, um, when people do want to prepare their meat, I take it really from you, when people are buying meat from you, there's nothing they need to do no. to it when they get home. Season it, put marinade on it, or some people like to cut the meat up at home, they'll take some braised steak, try them and say they'll cube it up themselves or something. Okay. You know, if they've got you know, nice kitchen types they want to use at home. And that, that, I mean, we've been asking people top tips wherever we've been going, and having a sharp knife. Uh, seems to keep coming up a lot, yeah. um, and it, I mean that must be something that's massive to you. Well, yeah, yeah. it's no the blunt ones because you cut yourself with a blunt knife. Because <laughs> you won't, you're going to use a lot more pressure with it. Oh, okay. I think you're not being sarcastic. No, not at all. I'm being totally serious. <laughs> okay. I was going to leave the sarcasm for a bit later. Oh, thanks. The the knife that you've got in your hand is really thin. Is that because you keep sharpening it, or did it start out that way? It's not. It's worn down a bit, but not much. Okay, see, my temptation if I was cutting meat would be to pick up a big knife, but you're using something. Well, if you're going to chop meat up into cubes or steaks, yeah, you want a bigger knife, like something like something like that. Yeah, a much bigger job. Yeah, yeah but okay. this this is a boning knife, so taking bones out, trimming meat. Okay, so you need it to be able to move around. Yeah. Okay. We, some... we like the curved ones here, so. Well, that must help you to get around things, which you're going to show us. Yeah, I'll show you something. Yeah, but... Okay. Um, see, someone that we spoke to recently said you only really ever need one knife. I think it's nicer to have different sizes, do different things. Yeah. Well. Anyway, that's that's a whole other conversation. Um, so before we get onto some uh, uh, watching what you're going to do with this huge joint that's in front of us, I'm going to ask you some of the questions that we always ask people yeah. when we see them. So, um, do you cook, son? Yes, I do. Okay, so do you have any particular tips in the kitchen? Yes, one pot cooking. Yeah, just keep it simple. That's what Everything I do. Everything in a big pan? Yeah. Yeah, chili, or, you know, ragu. Yeah, 
disc or an old pot. Nice and simple. Is that for the sake of making sure that there's less washing up? Or because yeah, you like the way that it develops flavours if you're yeah. in one pot? I like it one more. And um, if you, I mean, is that your main tip? Or is it, I mean, if you're cooking on a barbecue. Oh, yeah, it's different. I, I mean, yeah, grilling and smoking on a barbecue, yeah, well, that's a different way of cooking all together, isn't it? But, I mean, I, I mean, I see people kind of cooking things like to death on a barbecue. Um, yeah, so on the other way around, low and slow. Okay, so you would go lower temperature yeah. and keep it on there for longer? Yeah. Okay, you think that's the best way to get the best flavour out of your meat? If you're, you're cooking over wood, yeah, rather than gas. I use, I, I use um, wood, charcoal. Yeah. So, yeah, low and slow. Get all them smoky flavours in there. I did a trip for a big birthday a few years ago and um, went across America on the barbecue route, if you like. And yeah, that's, yeah, it was interesting. All over the slow out there. You must have had some amazing food. Oh, just, just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, our barbecue here is nothing like <laughs> Barbecue is to them is a religion. Mm. And they, it's not charred chicken drumsticks and sausages and to death. Crappy burgers done on a little gas grill. No, it's a lot more than that. Hours and hours and hours. We went um, behind the scenes at a couple of restaurants and they got these big, what they call offset smokers. So a fire's made in one part, end of the, this big tank, if you like. And then we've got the cooking area and the smoke just comes through. Lovely oak smoke. 16, 17 hours cooking briskets. Wow. And then they're all wrapped up and they're resting. And then you eat them the next day. Amazing. But I mean, it's, it's, it's big in this country now. Yeah, we're that seeing a lot more of that. Yeah, we're seeing and a lot of that going it's, on. It's catching on, but there's some some real serious players out there doing it now, um, commercially and at home and stuff. But I see a lot of it on Instagram and stuff as well. There's a lot more people cooking with fire. There's actually yeah. fire schools and things like that going on. Oh yeah, there. fire management. Yeah, yeah. I mean. And it's just, yeah. beautiful bowls and the fire pits and stuff yeah. in people's gardens. Oh, yeah, beautiful. Now well, for me, see, I would put an aubergine on that. <laughs> yeah, or cauliflower. Yeah. yeah. Actually, you say that, one, one place we went to, they, they did smoke cauliflowers over on, on, a, on a barbecue pit. And I don't mind roasted cauliflower, I think that's quite nice. But the, the density of cauliflower means that actually there's so much you can do with it. So a marinade that I might put yeah, these on, were all marinade. Yeah, a marinade I might put on chicken for my menfolk, I would put the same thing on cauliflower. Yeah. You know, the same as spice mixes because yeah, like uh, when you when you kind of cut them into steaks and things like that, you can do a very similar thing with them. Yeah. Yeah, they work the same way. So but no, we had a yeah, we had a flask over there and it was um, we went from um, Georgia down to Texas, so we did we did two and a half thousand miles. So we saw all different Regions of barbecue, and wow. they're all fanatical about it. They're all, yeah. Did you have biscuits and gravy? No, I've had that before, but I had that. When did I eat that? I went, that was when I was in Virginia. Okay. I had biscuits and gravy, sausage gravy. Wow. So, biscuits being, I mean, that's what they're like scone. Yeah, but they're basically, they're, yeah, a savory scone. Um, and I've got biscuit recipes in my first book when I made this out there. And it, it's you trying to explain what that is to someone in the UK. It's basically, no, it's basically yeah. a, a buttermilk scone that you're having with a gravy. And the so gravy it's soaking is, it up. Yeah, the gravy is basically sort of like a bechamel and made, um, they get a thin layer of sausage meat in a pan and they really caramelise it up, almost crispy, break it all up and that goes in the, in the bechamel. Oh wow. Oh, it's, it's nice. It's almost like a cobbler. Yeah. yeah. You've got the, yeah. the piece on top. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, another thing that we always ask people, my big love, is leftovers. Yeah. So, is there anything particular that you like to do with leftovers? From roast bun and squeak. I think everybody knows bun and squeak. But yeah, that's what I would do. Everything in a pan. Shit. Fry Match it all up. Fry it all up. Nice. Yeah, even the vegetables. <laughs> but for me, leftovers always taste better. I, I, do, yeah. If I make something, I'm always going to make a bigger amount. 
so that there's a whole load left over because I was sitting there taste better. So it's only going to be the same with meat, surely? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll, we probably have the meat cold with bubble and squeak. So slice the meat up the next day and fry the bubble and squeak, but they won't. Got to be. Um, um, I'm not too sure what the answer is going to be to this question. I always, always also ask people, saying as I'm vegetarian, if I was coming for dinner, what would you make for me? Make a sandwich. <laughs> Which I would therefore not eat. So what would I eat? You know, a baked sandwich. I wouldn't eat a baked sandwich. Would you eat vegetarian bacon? Actually, no. i tell you why. I'm vegetarian because I like vegetables. I like brilliant things done with vegetables. Would you eat a plant-based burger? Yes, but I don't like the, the whole idea of... What's the difference of, between a burger and bacon then? But the whole idea of things that are being made to look like meat doesn't work for me. That's not why I'm vegetarian. Right. I want something that's tasty and, you know, like we're talking about the product. So you're telling me that if I, if I had some bacon sizzling in the pan, you, the smell? Yeah, it smells lovely, but I don't want to eat it. Oh, that's right. Oh, boy, there. I can appreciate the smell of it, just there. like, you know. So, we, yeah. The burgers that Graham cooked yesterday, you know, smell lovely, but it doesn't mean I want to eat them. Because it doesn't work for me. But if you want to do that with a nice big cauliflower steak, then yeah, that works for me. Mm. It's all about different food choices, isn't it? That's why we're doing this. That's why we have this yeah. podcast. That's the whole point. And um, um, I'm not too sure what the answer is going to be to this question. I always, always also ask people, saying as I'm vegetarian, if I was coming for dinner, what would you make for me? Make a sandwich. <laughs> Which I would therefore not eat. So what would I eat? You know, a baked sandwich. I wouldn't eat a baked sandwich. Would you eat vegetarian bacon? Actually, no. I tell you why, I'm vegetarian because I like vegetables. I like brilliant things done with vegetables. Would you eat a plant-based burger? Yes, but I don't like the, the whole idea of... What's the difference between a burger and bacon then? But the whole idea of things that are being made to look like meat doesn't work for me. That's not why I'm vegetarian. Right. I want something that's tasty and, you know, like we're talking about the product. So you're telling me that if I... I had some bacon sizzling in the pan. You, the smell? Yeah, it smells lovely, but I don't want to eat it. Oh, I'll oh, wait there. I can appreciate the smell of it, just there. like, you know. So, we, yeah. The burgers that Graham cooked yesterday, you know, smell lovely, but it doesn't mean I want to eat them. Because it doesn't work for me. But if you want to do that with a nice big cauliflower steak, then yeah, that works for me. It's all about different food choices, isn't it? That's why we're doing this. That's why we have this yeah. podcast. That's the whole point. Um, so, Dave, do you have any questions you would like to pose to Simon? Uh, not at this stage, though. Okay. You can cut that bit yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so are we doing all right? We seem to be yeah, fine. through yeah. it a lot faster than we did Are we last recording? Time. Yeah, we are recording. And actually, it's, it's flowing a lot better as well this time. Okay, well, it means we're not talking about... Yeah. We're not being so familiar, are we? <laughs> I think I think that. So no, I get that. I'll totally get no, that. Totally. Actually, it's working better because of yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, one question I'm going to ask you that a friend of mine asked is, how would you age meat? Or dry age meat? Um, well, for me, my question is, yeah. why do you age meat? Okay, so once you kill an animal. Process called decomposition starts. Right. Or, so, what we do with it, we slow it down with the fridge. Right. Initially. And then there's this other thing called dry age, whereby we, we play with the climate of the fridge for i.e., control the humidity, the temperature, the airflow, to keep the meat, in a, in, to slow the decomposition down even more. Right. In a safe way. Because surely decomposition would produce something massive. It would do, yeah, of course it would. But yeah. we're, we're keeping it, or we're slowing it down, we're keeping it safe to eat with refrigeration. Right. So basically, all it's doing is it's dehydrating, it's losing moisture. Mm. 
So it's like you're making a sauce. The more you yeah. knock that sauce down, the more concentrated the flavour is going to be. Yeah. And that's what aging does. Okay. So we, we've got a, an aging room just around there. We keep that running at one and a half degrees with a relative humidity between 78 and 82 percent. And the meat will stop in there for four to six weeks. So it's a storage thing. Storage. Rather than a flavour thing? No, for, for all flavour. So right. we're, we're letting the meat lose moisture in a controlled environment to improve texture, flavour. Okay. So Mainly over with beef. So if my friend was asking me how would you age meat at home, would that would already have been done for you, would it? Or is that something you'd ever well, do? Well, we do it. Home? We do it here. Still dry aged beef. We're playing around with this as well, pork, dry as pork, it all works. Um, you could do it at home, but you would have to, I don't know, you could convert a fridge, I suppose, with a small dehumidifier in there. Okay. Um, a fan in there. So there would be a way that you could Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the noise in the background, what's he making? That's a vacuum packer. Oh, okay. So as people will realise, we are here at Simon's shop, so there's lots going on around us, which is what you can hear. Um, because we wanted to be in the place where it all goes on. Yeah, he's, um, he's just packing up some chicken, so that's going out tomorrow. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. So what I would like to ask you now is to show us some of your knife skills. So what have we got on the table in front of us? It's a shoulder of pork. Okay. So, a kilo pig. That's a big leg sticking out of the table. That's the front leg, yeah. Okay. And what are you going to do with this piece? Well, I can make a shoulder roast for you. So how we just sell it in the shop. Right, okay. Yeah. So you're going to have to explain this to me. What are you looking at? What am I looking at here? So you've got an open cut piece, but the skin's already been removed. So if you imagine... So we've got all the skin still on the back. That's your pig alive, yeah? Stood up. Oh, right, okay. So Head to that end. Okay, we've got the foot on the table. Around. So he'd be stood up like this. So that's his, that's his shoulder lock. Right. Yeah. So this has obviously been peeled and it's been split down the middle. Okay. So this is one half of it. Okay. One and a half of the shoulder. And so this is still some rib cage. That's the ribs, yeah? Yeah, okay. So you've got your neck bone there. Okay. Your cervical vertebrae going into your dorsal vertebrae, and this is where the head sits. So, what are the pieces you're going to need to remove from that stone into that. a joint? Okay. All the bones. I'm going to attempt to talk through this, but you might have to help me with this one. Right. So, what's the first thing you need I'm to do? I'm going to cut the foot off. Right, okay. And what happens to all these pieces that you're cutting off? Um, all, the, all the bones go, get collected once a week. And they go off to, to make um, IODs and all sorts of bits and pieces. Right, okay, so nothing goes to waste. No. So, what are you going to cut out now? This is the breastplate or the sternum. Right. There's a load of crystals in there. Just cut through those. Your knife just goes through it like butter, it's amazing. So, this is why you like using a smaller knife, so you can get right into yep. the detail. Yeah. What's coming off now? That's just the gland out of the neck. Take the ribs out. So you keep on yeah. sharpening your knife against the steel to go along. Yeah, just to keep the. So these ribs that would be cut up and put on a, on a barbecue. You what? could do, but you want the ribs a bit from a bit further down. Okay, so this is this is at a different point. Yeah. So they've got less meat on these. Yeah, they have. Yeah. So they need to come out, and you'll strip the meat off them. Yeah, and that will just go in our sausage trim pile. comes out as one piece and then I'll tidy it up afterwards. So that's one whole single piece yep. that's got the ribs and the neck bone. Okay. And then that's your that where, the, where the head sits. Right, okay. So in here the colours of it now it just looks like bacon. Or yeah. the strips and the colours. Yeah that's what you would get. Well, 
different kind of thing. Some bacon's a bit red. Oh, I suppose, yeah. Anyway, this, okay. this could be bacon once we've cured it. We could do that with that. All right. But okay. I'm going to make a roast out of it. So in here somewhere, there's a joint. So you're cutting right down the middle. Yeah. And then crack in. So that's the joint between the shoulder blade and your right. hum humerus. Don't need that. So what's going to happen to that bit? We would uh, take all the bones out, all the skin off, and that would go for the sausages. Right, okay. So I'm going to take the shoulder blade out of this now. So all of, basically, any kind of bone or gristle is coming out. Yep. It's got a nicely thick layer of skin and fat on it. Yeah, more fat there. My understanding is the fat makes me taste better. It does. Even if you don't end up eating the fat, just keeping it on there to cook it, is yep, it? Yep, absolutely. Okay. You just follow the contours of the bone to be nice. So, as we've said in previous episodes, we do have a YouTube channel, so you can watch Simon doing this on our YouTube channel. And just look for the food book pod on YouTube. But the, the, and how long does it take you to? How long did it take you to be able to do that without even thinking when you just started doing it? Do you know what? You get shown it and you, it doesn't take long at all really. It's repetition, repetition, isn't it? Yeah. But when you first start doing it, I suppose oh, you're you, probably, and thumbs, yeah. you probably cut off more meat than you should. I and guess. yourself. <laughs> I'm just taking this gristle out here. So the shiny bit is the gristle. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's like an orchestra, they're watching you just move the knife through the meat. What's happening now? I'm going to score it, like the crackling. So you're scoring the skin. So you score that in readiness, it's not what someone does in their hand. We could do, but you... It's a hard work. It is, you need a really sharp knife, yeah. Okay, so you score it in readiness for somebody. Absolutely. Crackling, I do remember as a child, that was always the thing that everybody wanted to do. Well, we probably score it, so when, when it's cooked and it's gone hard and crispy, you can break it up easy with the score marks. Is that how you make poor scratchings? Yeah, they do hydrate the skin at first and then um, they'll cook them in a fryer to puff them up. Oh, right, okay. So now we're tying it up. Yeah. So what is the point of tying it up? Well, to make it, to hold it all together. So we so, can cut a nice joint off of it. So this is to help you with cutting it rather than how it cooks? Yeah. Right, okay. So when someone gets home, would they take the strings off? Only when it's cooked. Right. See, I use butcher's twine when I I tie up dough to make it into a pumpkin shape loaf. And we use butcher's twine. Yeah. And it always fascinates me that it doesn't burn. No, it doesn't, does it? It's got to be coated or something. I don't know what it is because I've no idea. Okay. They call it right um, number five rayon, so this string. Something, yeah, there's something, but this is a bit shiny, isn't it? Something mm. about it. So you're gonna again watching you tie this up. You do it just second nature. Yeah. So that must have taken some time. This is one of the hardest that. things to teach anybody. Oh, is it? Yeah. Because there's a the process. Best. So you're taking the, the strings all the way around it. What? Okay. And then I make a loop with that underneath that string. Wow. And then okay. come back through the loop with that tag. Right. That one's something that you'd have to watch because yeah. that's impossible to try and explain. <laughs> Show you it's like someone with the art of knots. So you've got two strings, and you're going through it with your forefinger. You're holding one twist piece, it round. twist it round, and pull it up and under the over the other one. Yeah. Then pull it. Uh, I'm not even trying to explain that. And then just anchor it off. You see, you say just because it's something that you do over and over again. Absolutely. Show the pound. So 
this is how you end up with this beautifully tight. But I like as well the knots all end up in a line. So okay. it's, it's, I know, but it makes it, you know, it's for my brain, I think it, it's a bit strange. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the whole point of it, isn't it? Make it not and tidy. Yeah. I can't stand long strings as well. Helicopters, I call them. Okay. But if you, assuming meat, meat reduces in size massively when you cook it, doesn't it? So surely well, you, the strings get loose. They will do, yeah, but they won't fall off. They just, they just round. You just it. cut them off when it's cooked. So that's okay. a. That's How a much would you say that weighs? Five, six kilos. Would somebody buy that whole piece like that? Some people do, yeah. They've got a big crown, yeah. So how long would that take to cook? Well, if it weighs five kilos, you're going to go 20 minutes, that's 12 pounds. So 20 minutes a pound. Yeah, so that's... A long time. A long time. So it's a long time to cook it and then a long time for it to rest, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, that one resting. But you cook that cup low and slow. Right. So it almost fall apart anyway. You want that, you want it to do that. Because yeah. you think about the muscles in that shoulder, they're all going to be busy muscles, so they're going to be tough. Yeah. So they need the long, slow cooking to break all that collagen down. And so that's another reason for doing yeah. it the long, slow. Yeah. I mean, that makes me think of... Um, the sticking goes <laughs> When I was in the Middle East, I would see them cooking a lot of um, goats or lambs, lambs yeah. you know, and whole, and you'd see them on the buffets, and people would just be putting their hands into the meat oh. of the animal, and it'd just come away so Spot. Yeah. softly. I mean, then the smell, just amazing. So that's low and slow again. They're cooking that low and slow in these big clay ovens, and it's, it's sort of creating its own humid environment to cook in. So it's, it's it's its own steam, if you like, and that's what's going to make it lovely and soft and tender. So really, it's you know the, the steam and all of the juices and cells that come out kind of go all back in again. Yeah. Like it, you do with the tagine pot, where it catches yeah. the steam and it all drips back down onto it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What well, I minute? Mean, so we get this out on the weekend, it's going to the counter. Mrs. Jones comes in, like a piece of pork, please watch it. Yeah, perfect. And they'll say, well, we've got eight for dinner and something like that. So the question's popped in my head. So if someone took that home and wants it for the future, could they then freeze it? Yep. Yeah. Get a little freezer, right? Okay, and what would be the best way to defrost it? Uh, I don't know, it depends on what I would probably get it out and leave it in the fridge to defrost. Covered? Just in the packaging. Okay, and leave it in the fridge to Just to give it out nice and slowly. That way you're not, it's not, it's, it's in a controlled environment. Yeah. But again then, if you're gonna to come to, um, when you cook it, if you're doing it from room temperature, got, that must give you a chance to make sure it's fully defrosted again then as well. Yeah, I mean, you know it was defrosted because you'd feel it, you squeeze it, and it'd be soft. So you get it out and then let it come to room temperature to go in the oven. So that's how you would test it, I suppose, and yeah. just giving it a squeeze. Yeah. Okay. So then, if you go the other way and you have got cooked meat, could you then freeze that again once it's cooked? So you cook this, you, you've eaten it, and the leftovers, yeah, of course you can. Okay, so you can freeze yeah. that yeah. once you've got the leftovers. Well, you have got the time at home. So you've got bits and pieces. Yeah. Could you use that from frozen, or would you need to defrost that before you use it? Defrost it, yeah. Right, okay. I thought it just came into my mind, but so I wasn't like Because what we'll do as well, um, we'll cook a couple of joints, and then slice them up, package them up, put them in the freezer. So we can have a, a midweek roast, and it takes the time it takes the potatoes to cook, because the meat's already done sliced, so. I mean, I think a, mid a midweek roast is, something that people think is going to be such hard work, but actually, it doesn't yeah, need to be. yeah, it's quite easy to put together. Yeah. Something that always fascinated me living in the Middle East. So back then, I think they started to change it, but back then, the weekends were Friday and Saturday, because it, that was their day of um, worships on the Friday, so that was our weekend. Mm. But a lot of English families would still be having Sunday dinner. A Sunday dinner, cook a Sunday roast. Yeah, and you've got 40 degree heat outside and people are still cooking a Sunday roast, which I always thought was really fascinating because we'd rather be outside cooking something on a barbecue. But they were still carrying on those traditions, yeah. even in another country. I would turn down something like that. So we've now got the rest um, of this shoulder. shoulder of pig that you cut off. So what are you doing with this now? So I'm going to take the rest of the bones out, take the skin off. 
Yeah. And this is what goes in our sausages. Okay, so talk to me about sausages. What makes a fabulous sausage? It's what you put in it. So you, just, you only get out what you put in. So yeah. we only use carcass meat, if you like. So what I'm doing here, um, nice bit of fat on it. The sausage needs fat in it. Okay, next the sizzle. So we would use, um, it's all done on visual lean. So this meat that's in front of me now, we would want, we're looking for sort of 75, 80% visual lean, so 20% fat. Right, okay. So. And you're doing that by eye, by colour? Yeah, well, we know a shoulder yeah. is going to give us the right proportions. Right. Okay. So uh, and we might look for a bit of belly or a bit of fat at the back if it's too lean. Um, but that's what we're, we're kind of like 20 25% fat. Okay. And then, cool. When you cook them, do, isn't, doesn't the fat come out? No. No, okay, but why do you prick sausages? Or do you prick sausages? No, don't. Oh, do you not? No. Okay, I told you I don't know what I'm talking about. So well, you don't prick sausages? Do, it, do it, they not explode? The ones my brother eats might, but um, these don't. Okay, so this is about having pucker sausages. Pucker sausages. Right, okay, so pucker sausages are going to have 20 to 30% fat? 20 to 25% 20 fat. 20 to 25% fat, okay. You don't need to No be, gristle. No gristle. No yeah. skin. Because you're putting good quality meat in. Yeah, with some bread rusk. Okay. Spices, salt and pepper. Yeah. And the secret recipe. And then a bit of water to soak into the, you know, to help with the, the binding. Right. And it's minced, it's mixed, and it's filled out into a natural casing. Okay. I.e. intestine. Right. intestine. That's the thing we used to see them doing the generation game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Pretty much. Okay. So, um, I know you do lots of different flavoured sausages. Yes. So what's the most popular? Just that standard pork sausage. A straight pork sausage? Yeah. Okay. The, fla the flavours are, yeah, we sell them. Probably sell more in the barbecue season, um, but yeah, they're by far our best sellers. Okay, so the, 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 the skin and the bits you're taking up here, what's going to go happen to them? Well, the skin and bone, the skin and bone will just get thrown away. You're not tempted to take that hand and put it in front of them? No. Okay, because this not quality of stuff that you would eat? Well, you could eat it, yeah. I mean, people sometimes ask us for pork rind, skin, for cracklings and stuff. We, well, that meant that saves you having the yeah. argument around the dinner table, I guess. Absolutely. Thing. Okay. So, um, what I'm going to ask you about whilst you're doing that is the smoking. So, something yeah. that is always, we always know in our family, if anyone's been to Simon's, because everybody smells of smoke. Um, because you've usually, today you have, you've usually got the smoker going. Yeah. So, what is the purpose of smoking meat? Well, the main purpose for us is flavour, but it is one of the oldest forms of preservation. Um, yeah, we, we, we basically do it for flavour, so it's smoky bacon, we smoke chicken, we smoke fish, smoke salmon. Does all meat take on a smoke then? Yeah, we'll do, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if it's, um, we, obviously our bacon's all dry cured, so we add a dry rub of salt, sugars. Okay, and what's the point of that? Again, it's preservation. Right. So, so it would have been one of those old things that happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just a way of making the meat last longer. It's things like built on and all the dried meat, jerkies and stuff. It's just a, that stuff must last forever. Yeah, it's pretty bomb for it. <laughs> so it's salt basically being used for preservation, and yep. then the smoke is coming along to give it flavour. And uh, it and further preservation. Yeah, it would okay. help. Stuff growing on the outside, moulds and stuff, it's got some okay. of those properties. So, do you use any particular woods when you're smoking? Mainly beech, um, but we've used only because that's the most sustainable right. and it's the cheapest one to burn, if you like. Um, do different woods impart that much different flavour? Some of the uh, the woods they use in American barbecue are hickory and mesquite and stuff like that. Yeah, they've got quite a strong flavour. Um, oak and beech um, and some of the fruit woods like apple and cherry. It's a lot, it's a lot more subtle if you like. Yeah. 
Um, I like the flavour of the beach. Yeah. Must Works admit, for us. Whenever we come down here, the smell never seems that subtle. Because well, it's, <laughs> it's so concentrated when you well, hear Well, that, that machine produces a lot of smoke. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it does smell good. Yeah, it's um, yeah, an awful lot of smoke. So we can we can get a really nice colour on bacon in an hour and a half. Yeah, there's that. Wow, just from the smoke. Well, it's a, it, you know, it's an industrial bit of kit. It's um, it's not like a, a backyard smoker. No, obviously. Um, so and it doubles up as a cooker as well. So we can smoke a ham in there and cook it straight afterwards. Same with sausages. Okay. We make a. A Frankfurt or a you know Polish toss style sausage, we can put it in there, dry it, smoke it, cook it. So what makes a Frankfurt different from a sausage? They're emulsified. Right. So what do you use to emulsify it? Uh, we've got a machine called a bowl cutter, so it's got six blades in it, so the minced meat goes in this bowl and um, we spin it with the seasonings and some ice. We chop it until it's like toothpaste. Yeah, because it's a very different texture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's so it's emulsifying itself. Basically. Yeah, and you can you get more water into that kind of sausage. Right. The Germans make more sliceable. <laughs> okay, yeah. with Frankfurter. Yeah. Okay. So um, it's I mean they love lovely sausages and you get a root snap and but we don't sell as many. Nowhere near as many as what we sort of have traditionally for sausage. But I would have said as well that your so version, that yeah, your version of the Frank version is again going to be quite different from a supermarket version. Again, yeah, it's all about I mean, supermarkets are all about cheap food, aren't they? I mean, I think the worm's turning on that one. I think we've had cheap food in this country for way too long, and um, it, it needs to kind of needs to stop. And it's all about how we make that cheaper. And there's ingredients out there you can use to make stuff cheaper, i.e. these functional ingredients for like adding, keeping the water into a product. I mean, I've heard of hams developed that have got 40% water in them. Right. Yeah. That's something to make it cheap. Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot of stuff about the different chicken they're having a lot of water in. They're all, yeah, they, yeah, it's pumped with protein. And yeah. Well, this is partly what we're doing and hoping that we are inspiring people with trying different foods and maybe where they get their food from or how they choose their food. Yeah. God, what you do with that knife is amazing. Yeah, Just so follow the angles. Yeah, to join in there. So, um, we talked about sausages. Yeah. So, uh, hand in hand with our burgers. Yeah. Yeah, I know that you sell burgers because I've seen them. Yeah. So, what makes a good burger? Well, again, it's good quality meat. I mean, I did it by uh, my 50th birthday, we went across America and I learned all about that kind of thing. And before I went there, we, we would make a burger, so we'd mince some meat, we'd mix some seasoning with it, a little bit of water, we'd run it back through the mincer again, and we'd make burgers. They're okay, they're nice, nice flavour. But they're always a bit of rubbery or... And then, when I went to America, they don't do any of that. They just get really, really good quality meat, mince it, make a patty, season the outside, and cook it. Right, okay, so it's not industrialised at all? No. Well, some places would be, yeah. but a lot of these restaurants are making their own burgers. Just incredible. Game changer. So all done by hand? Yeah. So this so, is what you now do? Yeah, we do. And that produces what you think is a less rubbery burger then? Oh, totally, yeah. You've got, yeah. It's like, Chalk and cheese. But that again, it's got to come back to surely the quality of the meat that you're using in it. Yeah, so we would use um, there's three cuts of beef we use in our burgers brisket, chuck, and short ribs. So they're all nice, flavourful cuts that we traditionally use for long, slow cooking. Right. Those are flavour, and that's, that's a perfect mix. Again, it's 80 20. Okay. So 80 lean and 20 fat. Did, I think in my mind, my, my, maybe there is an idea that people think that sausages and burgers are a way to use up, I don't know, less than great bits of Historically, meat. Historically, it was a poor man's, Yeah. it was a way to use the scraps up to give those who perhaps couldn't afford the better cuts a protein, if you like. Um, it was the, 
yeah, it was a waste product, and now they're trendy. And some people want a good quality for it. If I go back to when I first started doing this job, the thought of putting that in sausages would be a, you know, green. Because it's too expensive. Because we'd use it for something else. Okay. Like a joint or... Whereas now, why shouldn't a sausage or a burger be as good quality as Correct. a joint? And that's what we do here. So, that's why we're still so many. Because you do it well. Do it, yeah. Do it but properly. that's why you have queues out the door. That's all, so, yeah. So, I want you to tell people about what it's like at Christmas. Because we, oh. we all know in our family not to get any conversation out of Simon come Christmas Eve because the build up is just oh, so sure. busy. We were basically doing a month's retail trade in two days. Because every, um, we've, we've got all our regular customers, which is great, and we get quite a few people to come just for a turkey once a year. Um, so we get a massive influx of customers. And you, you obviously see a queue, and um, it was great while COVID was on, because we only let two in at a time, so there was none of that pressure to sort yeah. of, you know, the, the customer had the whole shop to choose from. Because people in a queue feel under pressure because they know there's people behind them. I don't know what it is with us English people, yeah. but that's what we do, isn't it? Yeah. It won't be long, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But it's, but it's massive. It's not, oh. I mean, you end up with queues all the way down the road, don't you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I look out the back door and they're queuing around there and order up the lane. But they all come at once. You try and stagger it. You're never going <laughs> to, you're never going to, you know, give someone a time slot and that just doesn't work like that. Do you have any idea how many turkeys you sold, say, last Christmas? It wasn't a massive amount of whole birds. Um, probably 120 ish whole birds, okay. um, which isn't a lot by a lot of shops um, that I know of. Um, but we do a lot of boneless turkey. Right. So we probably did three quarters of a ton of turkey breast. Wow. So, yeah, which is a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, but yeah. now, of course, if people come now and they queue, they can actually get. Some well, refreshment because yeah, you've got yeah. a snack place outside yeah, now, so yeah, at least uh, people can get themselves a cup of tea. Yeah, and that's been, that's been there two years now. Please do that, yeah. yeah, I you, bet. I bet you like <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So, you can actually, if you come to Simon's, you can actually visit and try some of this produce yeah. from the snack guys out the front. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, what a great idea that was! <laughs> so, if people want to come and find the best butchers in Great Brick Hill. Um, you're only open on Fridays and Saturdays. Yep. Can people put pre-orders in? They can do, or they can just use the online shop and it will come by courier. Okay, so you do delivery? Yep, we we'll do that. Um, okay. We'll do a click, we'll, we'll do click and collect. So if you come here and pick it up? Yeah, if you let us know, give us a day's notice or something like that. We'll have an order ready for the following day. Okay, um, so there's lots of different ways that people can find the produce. Something I was going to ask about you, I remember you talking about a few years ago was um, British charcuterie. Yeah, we make charcuterie, yeah. Yeah, so what kind of products will come into that? Salamis, hair dried hams, anything that's been dehydrated that much, you know, so it's. Yeah. I mean, we make a, a fair bit of chorizo style sausage here, um, and salami. That's not as popular as the chorizo. Okay. And, and the air dried ham, that's what you can see over there in those cabinets there. Okay, so um, the kind of thing people might think come from other countries, you're making that here. Yeah. Now, the Italians and the Spanish, they're the masters, because they've been doing it for forever. And there's no way on earth you're ever, ever going to replicate what they do there, here. Yeah. So, my view on it is to try and make our own identity with it. So, do your best use the it. principles, use the, the methods, but work with what we've got here. You're never going to get a ham to taste like a serrano ham. Because we haven't got them big cork, you know, cork forest with all the acorns of these pigs going to eat. Yeah. Um, we've got things like beech woods and, you know. So there's going to be a flavour difference. There is. And we haven't got some of the big, you know, the, the, the vast spaces you need to hang all this stuff. Um, plus we don't, have, we don't eat as much as they do. Well, my, you know, as you know, my sister-in-law is Spanish, and she can oh, talk vociferously for many hours about the joys of hands, well, they, Spain, they, and uh, yeah. acorn-fed pigs, and all those things. There's so many different grains of it, and um, 
I think I prefer the Spanish over the Italian. Okay. It just has that edge. Um, but yeah, they produce. I mean, the Italians. It's this, this a great system. They've got. Uh, they make parmesan, as you know, and yeah. so all all the way. Yes. From the. Yeah, it goes to, goes the, to the pigs. Yeah. And then the pigs go for the palm ham and the salamis and the copper and stuff like that. Fantastic system. We just don't, haven't got that quite right here yet. Well, I can tell people because of, you know, having taken some home, I mean, my, my son has had treats so from everywhere and he does like yours. Yeah. yeah. He's well trained. <laughs> <laughs> so it's worth a trip. You need to come and have a trip or you need to look online. And also appreciate all the brilliant photography, which is all yours. On the website, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but do come and ask your butcher the questions. Come and actually pose the questions. Talk to us, yeah. That's what we're here for. Yeah. Talk to us. It's, if you want to do something different or you're not sure what you want to cook or you're not sure how to cook it, ask us. We'll tell you. But it's also for me, it's the enthusiasm and the excitement about your product. I've seen you in full flow. The boys are the same. We've got two lads yeah. here, Nick and Sam. Brilliant. And they're, and they're both foodies as well. Um, Nick's the next chef. Sam just lives to eat. And um, yeah, it's all the same. And you're extolling the joys. You know, yeah. This is why we do what we do. Yeah. You know, we talk about the foods we love, the foods that we make and share yeah. because of what we enjoy. Absolutely. Back to this pile of pork we have in front yeah. of us. Um, you've chopped it up, you've removed any bone to skin, what are you going to do with that now? Well, I'll put that in a tray now, I'll go in the fridge tonight, tomorrow morning, that'll be made into sausages. So okay. we're, we're minced, mixed, seasoned, fiddled out, and there'll be sausages. So that. from that pile you've got in front of you, how many sausages would that make? There's probably seven or eight kilo there. Uh, yeah, 20 pounds of sausage. Cool, job done. About 120 bangers. Nice. Yeah, 120. That's right. Brilliant. Thank you. And thank you for having us. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me into your world and behind the scenes and uh, putting up with our questions. I'm hoping that we will come back again at some point yeah. and that we can have more yeah. from you. Yeah. And if anybody's got any questions for Simon or anything that they would like to see him do or maybe we could include in the future, please do tell us. We can um, do that. But um, no, thank you for letting uh, this vegetarian into your world. Or maybe come and do the sausages next time, watch the sausages being made, something like that. Yeah. Brilliant. It's been really interesting. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome. Is that a wrap? That's a wrap. So many thank yous to Simon for sharing his world with us. I hope you found it of interest. And now we go back across to the beautiful fabulous kitchen of Cherie Denham who is going to show us how easily and quickly she makes lemon curd. I hope you enjoy it. Okay so what are you going to show us now Cherie? So I'm going to put together a lemon curd. Now normally a lemon curd is done over a bain marie so hot water in a pan, fold over the top and then you stand and you stir for ages and ages. But I just wanted to speed things up because I just... Large to show. Well, yeah. So what I'm going to do is break three eggs, first of all, into my pan. And these are your eggs? Yeah, these are my chicken's eggs. So Andy Denham asked me what I would like for my um, 50th birthday a couple of years ago. And I said, chickens. And he said, no, don't be silly. And I said, no, I mean it. I said, diamonds and pearls are overrated, chickens. Ah, that's nice. So he said, right, okay, whatever. So these are my chicken's eggs, and I'm just going to three eggs. It's a beautiful yolk. So they're nice and yellow. They're so happy chickens. Moment, we're just whisking them up loosely. Yeah, just okay. put those in there. And so Sharice just used the fork, basically, to mix them up. That's right. And then I've got the zest of three lemons. So again, I use a microplane alone because you get a really lovely fine zest. Okay. So the three lemon zests go in there. And then the juice of three lemons as well. Okay, so there's no waste on any of that. Yeah, in there. And another actually good thing is some people just use, um, might use two eggs and one egg yolk to make their lemon curd richer. If you do that, always freeze your egg whites. 
Oh, so that's a good one. Oh, you freeze egg whites? Freeze egg whites. Okay. And freeze them in a Tupperware box and just put a wee note on top of how many egg whites are in there. So that you know what you've got for your recipe. Correct. Because okay. 30, but but if you put lots in and you thought, oh, put me, I haven't put, as, haven't put a note of how many are in there. 30 mils of egg whites or one fluid ounce of egg white is the same as one egg white. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. So, you're a man of information. <laughs> so in here is going 85 grams of butter. I use unsalted. You don't have to use unsalted, but I've you got it in there. You cubed that already in I've, preparation? Yes, so I've put it all into wheat cubes because it will then melt at the same time as the sugar. Okay. So if you put it into one big lump, you're it's going to take longer to melt. Yeah. So this it smells like amazing. So we've got the whole eggs, we've got the lemon zest, the lemon juice and the butter so far. All, yes. All in together. Yeah. And then 110 grams of granulated sugar. Okay. Okay. So, so this is really is a one pot thing. Yep. Yeah. And then I'm going to put, just mix those all up together. Oh, it's so yellow. Yeah. Happy chickens, you see, that's what it is. And then what you do is you have a bowl. Oh, you do that bit now. And no, 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 and you're okay. saved ready. Oh, okay. Because we're going to cook it out now on the alga over here. So, so if you didn't have an alga, what kind of temperature would you be doing it on? So a medium heat on yeah. your normal cooker. Yeah. Because what you want to do is keep, you do keep stirring the stew, but it is quicker than the bain marie method. So when you stir, I'm using a spatula here because it goes right in around the edges of yeah. the saucepan rather than a, a wooden spoon which doesn't quite fit in around the edges. So stir, keep stirring until the butter is nicely melted and the sugar is dissolved, right? And then what we'll do is stir and stir gently until the whole lot thickens. <laughs> it's so hot. warm. <laughs> See, I am so used to the heat of it. I'm like a cat. I like to just hug the other. <laughs> right. So can you see here, the butter's all starting to melt. And I yeah. can feel that that grittiness from the sugar. Is oh, you can feel that well. with the, through the spatula. With your, so yeah. the spatula's right on the bottom of the pan as you're stirring. Absolutely. So you can feel that it's dissolving. Yes. Okay. And it's still liquid at this stage. Okay. And... What we want to do is get it to be thick enough without boiling. It mustn't boil because if you boil, let it boil, it will just go to sweet scrambled eggs. Okay. Doing it gently and, gra and gradually like this and keeping it all going at the same time means that it will start to all thicken and emulsify at the same time. Okay. So what we do is go right around the edges again, all over the base of the pan. So is this... I've never made this, so you know, excuse my naivety, but no, no, no. is this going to thicken in the pan and then get thicker when it's as it sets, or uh, how does it work? Yes, absolutely. So now it's liquid because um, you've melted the butter, you've melted the butter and the sugar, and now bit by bit it's starting bit by bit to just get slightly, slightly thicker. And what we're going to do is just wait for it to what's called coat the back of the spoon. Yeah, okay. So at the minute when we do this and we put our finger through, there's a wee bit of a trail. Okay, so on, really. the back, on the back of the spatula. Yeah. Okay. And this is where you now need to, you can see that it's starting to thicken now, Elaine, so yeah. we need to be quick, quick, quick. This is why we had our sieve and our bowl ready. So as it starts away. to thicken, you're stirring it faster and faster and faster. Yeah. And can you see how? before. Can oh, you okay. see? So when you when you make that, um, so on the back of the spatula, yeah. it's sticking, and you make yeah. like this. Okay, the the trail is made, and then straight into your pan or straight into your sieve. So it's we're taking it, and scraping it from the saucepan into the sieve, which is sitting over your bowl in preparation. Yes, every single last. I take it if you lick that spatula right now, it's going to burn your tongue like mad. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what we want to do now is get the sieve in. So this, so this is your ladle. round. This is your <coughs> silicone ladle. The silicone ladle from your tip that you shared with us. Yes, so a, a silicone ladle. So what you want to do is round and round in the shape. You go round and round rather than back and forth. So you're moving the the ladle round and round through. Yes, the metal sieve. And can you see wow. how quickly it's that has come through? Fried. 
yeah? Now, it is going to be slightly softer and runnier now because it's hot, yeah, sugar and, and butter, okay? So they're going, they're all obviously going to be soft when they're melted. But as it cools down, it gets more and more firm. So that's when it takes on the curd, the, 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 the more solidified texture that we would know. Yes. So and you're yeah. ending up with a little bit on the back of the so ladle say, that you don't need. So that's the lemon zest that's on there, is it? Yes, and any wee bits of egg, stringy eggs that haven't been cooked through. Okay. So, so because you're using a silicone ladle, you can press through every last bit of flavour out of that zest. Oh, okay, so I can see because you're pressing round against round, you're getting as much out of it as possible, basically. Yes, and also because this, the the um, ladle is silicone, it's you, you're not risking the, uh, a discoloration of your curd or your curd going um, metallic, metallic or anything okay. like that. So that's that. Okay, I'm just. It is a very very glorious yellow colour. It's like a wee bowl of sunshine, isn't it? It is. There we go. And it's already, if you, I'm just wobbling the bowl and it's already starting to take <coughs> a wobble. Indeed. So what I'm going to do is just give it a stir. Give it a stir so that it, it cools down. I'll leave it in the pantry to cool down. Now, what you can do at this point is put <coughs> maybe a wee piece of um, baking parchment or greaseproof paper down over the top of it so it doesn't form a skin. Yes, okay. And then I put it uh, through a funnel, a jam funnel, into a preserving um, jar or a jam jar and put it into the fridge. Do you know, this is what I need. The amount of things I put into jars and I slop it everywhere. So this is what I need. I need a jam funnel. Yeah, so I got that from the Kilner site okay. um, because they, I have <coughs> lots of the preserving stuff from them. So if you're going to put it into the jar, you have to make sure that your jar is hot and your lemon curd is hot because if you put lemon curd yes. into a hot into a cold jar, it could crack your jar. So do you do you so you, you put the hot curd into a warm jar and you don't wait for it to be cold to go into a cold jar? No, no, you put hot curd into a hot jar, but if you were going to say put it sorry, I should have said if you're going to put it into a cake or something cool it down in your pantry okay and then um you know use it later on to fill your cake or to put on your buns or to do whatever you want to do with it cool. um, but yet you're going to keep it put it in your jar hot jar and then let it cool down and then put it into your fridge and you can freeze it for about a month in the jar wow it will freeze because of the acidity of the lemons it freezes beautifully so how would you warm up the jar you just put it in the oven briefly so i will put some hot water in it um, well, I, I would um, put it through the dishwasher if you've got a dishwasher uh, going okay, so on. sterilise it as well. Yeah. Okay. Or you could put just hot water, a bit of fairy liquid, wash it through, dry it off, and make sure it's hot that way, and then, yeah, put in your curd. Fabulous. Don't taste a bit warm. I feel I shouldn't be sticking my finger in there. <laughs> no, I'm going to get you a spoon. Tell you all more cons here. Oh. Right. Just take a wee bit from the edge so you don't burn the bake off yourself, as we would say. Okay, so I'm just going to spoon me. Oh. oh. That's lovely. It's really light as well. And citrusy because you yeah. pushed so much through with all that lemon. Brilliant. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. It's fabulous. I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. Please do listen to the podcast for all of the information and check the website for the recipe details. Thank you for watching and listening to the Food Bod Pod, brought to you with Matthew's Cotswold Flour.